right. So what do you think, Nathan? Shall we kick Let's it off? Let's do it. Well, thank you very much, everyone who has joined in. I'm very happy to see so many of you from so many countries of the world. Uh, and a very warm welcome to this webinar today on how to captivate your online audience with Nathan Gold. This webinar today is hosted by Slido. And if you don't happen to know Slido yet, you'll get to know it, uh, I guess, today much more. Slido is a web-based tool that you use at meetings and events to increase your interaction. And of course, it's used at virtual and online events and meetings as well, just like today. I would like to encourage you to submit your questions. And you can do that throughout the entire webinar, so you don't need to wait until the very end. But as Nathan is speaking, as Nathan is presenting, please feel free. If you have any questions, we are so happy to, to have those questions in. We'll be answering them at the end of the webinar. And of course, feel free to either submit them with your name on or anonymously. You have that option as well. Make sure you upvote the ones that you really like. And uh, to very quickly introduce myself, my name is Christina Kumor. Uh, I work at Slido and I'm in charge of thought leadership, but I'm not very important today. I'm just your very simple host. But my special guest today is Nathan Gold. Hello, Nathan. Hello. Hello, everybody. So who is Nathan? There are actually three uh, important aspects I would like to introduce Nathan with. First of all, he is a proud father of twin girls. And not many people can say this, right? <laughs> so well done on that. Uh, second of all, uh, Nathan really travels around the world and he's helping people to prepare for their uh, high stakes speaking opportunities. He's also an expert on how you can really put your speaking anxiety under control. And last but not least, uh, he's a very good friend of Slido. And he's been a friend of ours for unbelievable six years now, if I'm not wrong. So, That's right. I'm, so I'm very happy that he accepted our invitation to be our special guest on the webinar today. And without further ado, I guess I pass the word over to you, Nathan. Thank you very much, Christina. And thank you for your time and helping arrange all of this. So let's get right to it and make sure that we can just give you all this uh, information and let you run with it and try using it because it really just requires some ex experimentation. So I have for you 12 ways today that you can use to captivate your online audience. And as Christina asked you, please feel free to use Slido to ask any questions along the way and we'll look at all those questions at the end. This is not really the kind of presentation to, that, I, that I feel would benefit from taking questions at each one of these. So let's take them all at the end, especially since we're online as we are here today. All right, so to start with, I would like to ask you to please answer this question, which is how many times have you presented online already? Just approximately. And let's see what the numbers come in at so that I can get an idea of who I'm talking to right now. Because in the way you registered for this workshop or this webinar, I should say, we didn't bother asking you these questions beforehand, which we could have, but at least now I see that more than half my audience has presented very few times. So that's super. That's great. A quarter of you have never presented online, which is even more fun because these 12 things I'm going to share with you can be used by just about anybody. You may need to buy a little equipment here and there, but you don't need a whole lot to actually make it possible for you to captivate people online, just like you do when you're in person. And for those of you who have done it a ton and too many times to count, I promise you as well, I will give you some things that you can do to elevate and up-level your game as well. I always like to do a before and an after. So what I'd like to start with is asking all of you to please answer this question with one word. Just describe how you feel about presenting online right now, especially those 56% of the people who never have. Just put in one word, submit. If you wanna enter another word, put that one word and submit another one. You can submit any number that you want, but I'm just looking for one word at a time here. And let's give this a, a couple seconds here to come in and see what these words pop up on, on this beautiful, organic, instant word cloud. 
And then what I'm going to do is ask you the same question at the very end of this little webinar and we'll be able to compare the results. And the results I'm seeing coming in here right now are quite typical of the way people feel at the beginning of this webinar. Okay, it looks like 34 of you have already uh, put in a word, so we'll, we'll keep it at that for right now. And thank you so much for participating in this word cloud. All right, so who is this webinar for? Well, two groups of people. It's if you're presenting one-to-one -one or one-to-many. It is not for people who are in a many-to-many -many situation where you're many people in a room with many people out there. That's a very complicated and quite a few of the things I'm gonna share with you here today uh, are really hard to do in a many-to-many -many situation. So, one-to-one, one-to-many. So let's get going. The first one, the first way to captivate your audience online is never start on the hour. Always start five, 10 minutes past the hour. Why? Well, first of all, just starting at 7.10 or 8.10 probably made you think, whoa, why are we starting at an odd time when you saw the invitation in the first place? So that was perhaps a tiny bit captivating. But the main reason I do it is because I want you all to have time to finish whatever you were doing before my webinar. And I need to give you a couple of minutes, <clears throat> excuse me, a couple of minutes for you to get your tech set up and perhaps your lighting, maybe stop at the loo, get a cup of coffee before my webinar starts at 10 minutes past the hour. And I can tell you from doing this for many, many years, my webinars usually start on time that way, especially in the old days with <clears throat> some of the heavier products that always required you to download stuff before it would actually work. So start on an odd time, 8.05, 8.10, 8 even 8.15, but you must not run over the top of the hour. Number two, if people can't hear you, you can't captivate them. So most important when you're presenting online is sound quality. So be sure that you test all the different quality microphones that you have at your disposal right now. The ones that are inside the laptops Sometimes they're in the wrong position for where your voice is going, so it's hard to adjust the location of your microphone, so an external microphone, or perhaps just your, just your headset. I've taken just my headset sometimes and plugged it in and moved the microphone over nearby me where people can't see it in mobile situations. But then I have kind of hands-free during the presentation. I don't have to have them in my ears. So do your best to make sure that you have excellent sound quality. I'm not a big fan of Bluetooth headsets when you're doing webinars or online presentation like this because if the Bluetooth goes down, the radio goes down, then you have to run all over the place. So I would much rather connected headsets or maybe something like this. If you do a lot of online presenting such as I do, I have that microphone on the left side of your screen sitting right in front of me here about seven inches away from my mouth. I don't want to move it right now because then I have to go readjust it and whatnot. But just hanging right down in front of me because I do a lot of these kinds of sessions. And that microphone is a very professional type of microphone. So it depends on what you want to do and how you want to work. If your office at home, like mine is a permanent office at home and it has been for 12 years now, I have slowly acquired all the equipment to make sure that I can do these kinds of coaching sessions online. And believe me, Online and remote coaching and remote presenting works. You just have to think a little bit differently. So let's move on to number three, eye contact. This is probably the number one thing that's messing people up when it comes to presenting online versus presenting in a room with people. You know the game. When you're in a room with people, you can tell if they're looking at you or not. But when you're presenting like this, I don't have any postage stamps of you on, on my screen right now because Sometimes it's a little distracting. So I just look at my slide, but I'm not looking down. I'm not looking up. I'm positioned the camera at a place where it looks like, hopefully, if you're looking at the video feed of me, I should be looking right at you. And I'll show you what you can do with that. All you need to do, whoops, all you need to do is move the camera up so that it's approximately eye level. 
some books at home would do this if that's where you're where you're working from or buy one of those stands where you can ratchet it up and put it up at the height you want it to be and that's where my laptop is right now is right up at the top but i'm not even using the camera in my laptop here's the thing i'm doing which gives me more of a sense of looking at you i've actually mounted my camera on a little tripod off to the side that's literally in front of my screen so that way, using my peripheral vision, I know exactly what's on the screen, but I can also stay glued, and I mean glued, to the camera. Because the camera are the eyes of my audience. And if I'm not looking at the camera, then I'm not looking at the eyes of my audience. Even if they're not looking at me at the moment, it definitely looks like I'm looking at you. At least I hope so. So the camera needs to become your friend. I've even had people put a picture of the person you're presenting to, a small printout of the face of the person on the camera lens, cut a hole right in the eyeball, and then look at that person. You kind of have to fake out your head a little bit because it's really weird to have 30, 40, 50 people online and not be able to, you know, touch, see, shake your hand, all of that stuff is weird, is weird in the beginning, but you can get used to it very quickly. But the camera needs to become your friend, especially the lens. Number four is your ability to do this on the move. If you're in, a, in an office where you have everything set up, it's all well and good. But if you're on the move and you're in a mobile situation, stuck in your car or maybe in, a, in, a, in an office that's not yours, I carry with me a, tri, a tripod, I like to call it. And it's not my name, but it's a tripod. It's just a selfie stick with a tripod splay at the bottom so that you can literally set it up, raise up, put your phone on it, and you're off and running. In a situation like this, you typically don't need to have a microphone because if you're close enough to your smartphone, the microphone built in is usually good enough. The problem is the lighting, but we'll talk about that in just a moment. So let's take a break from those uh, 12 that I wanna share with you and talk about a couple of things that I've noticed, especially since December and over the last three or four months. We need as a, as a, as, a, as a presenter and as a communicator to realize that when you're communicating with people online today, most of those people are at home and they're in a bedroom or a, a home office. So I would like to encourage you for some time until we get through the pandemic to have more empathy for your listeners. And what I mean by that is not to necessarily deep dive into how they're feeling that day, but just in your own self, realize that they are in a similar situation that all of us are in, in terms of crammed into our little bedrooms, making it look like an office, trying to do the best we can. Just take your time, be kinder, show more empathy. And the way you do that, in my opinion, is to break away from the standard, okay, ladies and gentlemen, I'm so excited to be here and blah, 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 and present like you normally would in a room. I, I think you need, personally, you need to dial it back a little bit and, and just soften it a little bit. Perhaps don't be as enthusiastic as you would normally be in a big room, but maybe just dial it back a little bit, be a little bit more conversational with people, and, and try not to be so perfect in front of the camera and just be human. And those are a few tips I wanted to pass on. And why do I pass that on? Well, I've been watching a lot of these demo days be pushed online now and it looks terrible. They're just getting up there and just presenting to the screen like nobody's there anymore. And they forget that that audience is really out there listening. So. Lighting, number five. Lighting is uh, sometimes easier than you think, but if you're sitting in front of a window with a lot of light coming in from behind you, the likelihood is people will not see you, and therefore it's hard to captivate an audience if they can't see you. Same could be true if too much light is coming in all over the place, your face could get completely washed out. 
Sunlight is a bad thing indoors. It moves around, it changes during the time you're talking and it messes with the reflections in the room and your face. So be very careful of trying to do a meeting or a presentation with sunlight. I would cover up the windows if you can and try to get into a place where you have more control over your lighting. Ideally, what you really wanna have is just two lights sort of off to the side, a little bit above you that are hitting your face with enough intensity that it doesn't brighten you too much or darken you too much. And this is a very professional setup that you're looking at on the screen, but I'm here to suggest to you, you don't need that big of a professional setup. What I'm working with right here in my office, and I have been now for over two years now, is I have two of these Casa Smart light bulbs that are non-hub requirements to activate and use with my phone so I can control the, not only the intensity of those lights individually, but also the colors. I have the full spectrum of color that I can work with. They're about 25 US dollars. You can order them online and they don't require a hub. So it's very easy to put them in, turn them on, and you got your smartphone to work with. And then I have two very inexpensive shop light like things that handle 150 watt bulbs. Each of those uh, receptacles are about 10 bucks, 12 bucks a piece. And then I have two stands that I can raise up and lower down, depending if I'm standing or sitting. So literally for under 100 bucks US, you can have a whole nice setup for lighting. And there's other ways of doing it, but I just thought I'd pass on to you what I have here in my office. Before I move on to the next way you can captivate an audience, I'm frequently asked when I'm presenting online, should I stand or should I sit? Well, in my vocabulary, the word should isn't even there. So my question to you is, what do you want to do? Right now I'm standing because I love standing when I'm presenting, but I also present when I'm sitting because sometimes I don't need to present. I'm just having a meeting. And if I'm just having a meeting, I might sit. So it's really up to you what you want to do. What I'd like to recommend, though, is what people see behind you. So perhaps if you're standing like I am right now, you want to have maybe a backdrop behind you. Or if you're sitting, <clears throat> I'll let you in on a little secret here. You're actually looking at my backdrop is actually a piece of material that's been printed to look like a brick wall. It's not a real brick wall and it's about two feet from me so I can move it away from me and I can switch it out depending on my mood and they're not that expensive to buy online. Then you need a couple stands to hold it up. That's it. So if you want to captivate people online and you see 13, 15 people there and they're all in their, in their home offices looking at the ceilings or the walls or that sort of stuff and you want to stand out and be like attract attention, pick an interesting backdrop. Now, I know that, that you can swap out Zoom and stick in a backdrop behind Zoom, but I got to tell you, that's, that won't work with GoToMeeting, Skype, and all the other tools out there. So if you want to have a generic background that you use everywhere, in no matter what tool you're using to present or communicate online, get your own backdrop. And if you really do want to use your own pictures, get a green screen or a blue screen to go behind you so that you really can make it look great, just like they do on television. And uh, for those of you who want branding behind you, they have the, uh, what is it called? Uh, step and repeat banners. So you can print yourself or get a, a step and repeat banner with your logo on it, put that behind you, and then all your videos, all your meetings, all your communications are done with some branding. Simple little tip. Okay, number six. When you first come into an online meeting, your portrait is usually shown to the audience. Well. I'd like to suggest to you that you check that portrait, check what it looks like, because it might not be as, like, as good as you think it is. When you put it into that little setting and you don't look to see what other people see, it could end up having all kinds of pixelation to it. So please double check what you look like. Make sure that the picture you're using is one that when people look at it, they say, oh, you look happy or you look trustworthy. What kind of a feeling do you want people to have when they look at your portrait? Okay, and use that portrait. I mean, in fact, if you have a fun thing you want to share with the audience, like you play, uh, play a particular instrument, put that on there if you want to. Have some fun with it. 
but do check to make sure that people can see what you want them to see. Number seven, this one I only use on occasion, but I use it on purpose. And that is sometimes during a presentation, I will auto have things automatically sent to people for them to open them at that time in the presentation. Now, usually I can kind of time them and do the send at a particular time. And then what it allows me to do is kind of break the monotony of people sitting there like you are right now and you're listening to what we're saying, what I'm saying, maybe taking some notes. And then I can say as a presenter, okay, now in your inboxes, all of you should have, and I'm, don't go there because I didn't send one to you. I, I know you've all seen PDFs, but there's a, an email that has been just sent to you with a PDF. Could you all please open that up and go to page two? And then you give people a couple of minutes to a couple of seconds to do that. And now boom, they're engaged, they're moving, their arms are moving, the mouse is moving, their eyes are moving, and now they can open something up. Again, I don't do this a lot, but if you're going on and on and on, rather than send everybody the stuff at the beginning of the meeting, set it up to be sent automatically or have a, a co-moderator with you send it out at the time exactly uh, time to when you say things. I often can have people help me on the back end do things like that if needed. Number eight, secret notes. This is a way to captivate your audience with maybe certain things that you're having trouble remembering the exact order you want to say them in. Write them down on a sticky note and put it behind the camera and nobody will know they're there. And then all you need to do is sort of glance over and you see, okay, those are the words, got it, can say it. And you can use your peripheral vision and pick up those little cues, my secret notes, so that you don't have to worry about it at all. You can relax, lower your anxiety. Well, I remember those three words. Well, I remember that number. It doesn't matter. Just put those stickies all over the place. But please try not to write out your script and then look at the camera and try to read it because they will know you're reading usually. Number eight, interruptions. And I'm sorry, number nine, interruptions, is since we're all, most of us now are at home, we're getting interruptions in the middle of things. You can't put a red light on your door and say, on the air. Well, wait a minute. Why can't you do that? That's a pretty good idea. I might buy one of those and put it on my door. But people will just come in, they'll interrupt you. And it, you have to understand, it's actually quite delightful. If you have a cat, I have two cats at my house, and if the door is open, they're in the office. They like to walk on my shoulder and sit on my, I have one shoulder cat, like this gentleman, that's not me, of course. But if a cat walks in and gets on your shoulder, it's like, unless you're presenting, and even if you're presenting, it's like, it's all right. In my opinion, depending on the, you know, who you're presenting to, it's okay for things like your dog to be in your lap when you're sitting at the laptop or the, it's, it's okay, so long as it's not distracting, like barking and whatnot. And this is not new, by the way. I have been working with a, a home consultant now for 12 years that I met in my first year. And one of the things that he told me was the bird that he has, he has one of these really loud and birds that, Yak, 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 and it speaks and says words. The people he consults with always love to hear the bird. In the beginning, it was kind of annoying to him, but not to his customers. And now, part of his shtick is Where's the bird? Where's the I forget the name of the bird. Where's the bird? Bring the bird in. And, and he puts the bird on his shoulder and does his consulting, and it's, it's kind of fun. So it's another way of you being memorable, perhaps, and a way of your branding. So if you have a, a you know, a, a main coon, it just, you get it. Let and then finally, the, probably the interruption that would potentially scare most parents is when their child runs in. Well, it's okay. If you've already asked them to please not interrupt you and they come in, there's probably a good reason they're coming in. Just two days ago, I was on, the, uh, I was on a, a line like this with somebody and his daughter walked in and without even, it was, she was about maybe five, and without even thinking, he just looked over at her. She asked him a question in his ear. He said in a very loving uh, voice, uh, blah, 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 I couldn't language. 
And then she just left with a big smile. When he came back, she, he said, oh, she was just asking me what I wanted for dinner. And I thought, what a beautiful way to be interrupted. It was totally okay. Now, it wasn't like I'm presenting one to many and I got interrupted. Although if that happened here at my house, I would let that happen too. You just want to try to get it taken care of and move on. But that showed me that that particular person I was consulting with has the biggest heart ever. And he didn't get angry. He didn't snap. It was beautiful. So let it happen. Number 10. Virtual whiteboarding, especially collaborating. So there are tools popping up and some tools out there already have whiteboards where you can get in there and have people add to the whiteboard and collaborate with multiple people. I think virtual whiteboarding is a super great way to get your audience engaged and allowing them to participate using their own mouse or using their own touch type screen. This kind of uh, virtual whiteboarding for people that are drawing and making things is best used on uh, screens like uh, tablets and, and other types of surfaces where you can use your fingers and uh, pens. But virtual whiteboarding, stay tuned. There's a company in the north of Sweden that's about to announce a collaborative virtual whiteboarding system that is, well, it's going to change how whiteboarding has worked. Number 11, we're almost done so we can take time for questions. Number 11 is games. Now, while some of the tools that you're using to do the video conferencing allow quizzes and polling and things like that, like Slido has been doing for us so far, there may be a need or a use for a different type of interaction with your audience using games. For example, there's a company out there called Kahoot. It's just one example. I've known of Kahoot because they were a Norwegian startup back when I first started going to Norway about nine, almost 10 years ago. The difference between a typical quiz and using something like a Kahoot is that it allows you to put teams together, like groups of people together, pop up a question, have the team vote, and it, it's just it's just super great fun and it's a great way to teach, a great way to learn. So I encourage you to explore not only the tool that you're using for the video and the conferencing tool that you're working with, but also take a look at maybe something like a Kahoot or something like it could add a new dimension to captivating your audience at a different level. I've even seen Kahoot used by a scientist who said, you know, my data are all really boring. So how could I make my data more exciting? He said, well, make the audience guess what your data are. <laughs> so he turned all his data, all his charts into games. And he said, okay, you what do you think the percentage of the blah, blah, blah is? And people would boom, 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 boom. And then at the end, he would give out a little candy bar or something for the winners of each game. All right. And then number 12. Number 12 is how you get audience participation. If you want to captivate your audience, and I'm hoping that we've done that with you here today with Slido. Slido is one of those tools that I've been using since I was given my very first license. And before the pandemic came along, I would actually tell my audiences that Using Slido is a real nice to have, especially when you have one to many. And what I mean is like, if I had a hundred people in a hundred locations right now and I wanted to take questions, it would be virtually impossible or it would take a lot of time. So what Slido allows me to do as a presenter is tell you as an audience, any question, and I've already told you this at the beginning, so I'm not gonna repeat myself. Slido is my favorite tool for interacting with an audience by getting them to input their questions, upvote those questions to make it easier for me at the end to be able to pick the questions most people want to hear. And with all the advances that, they, that they've made in the last bucket of years, you've seen, you've seen those instant word charts, uh, word clouds that start popping up and, it, and all the stats and all of the, it's, 
I'm sorry, I'm probably gushing too much about Slido, but I just love using it. And the best part about it is you don't have to install anything. It just shows up. You could pick up your smartphone and do it right on your smartphone if you wanted to. And they also have a free version, so get started. Now, I'm a big believer in giving uh, one extra, what I like to call a bonus or a 13th item. And that is Slido has a blog and they posted this 15 virtual icebreakers for your remote meetings. The QR code on the screen right now will take you right to that spot. I highly encourage you to read it because number 15 is my favorite. And I'm going to leave it up to you to figure out the others. But it's got a very nice list of things that you can do, not just at the beginning, not just at the end, but in between as well. So there you go, folks. Those are the 12 ways to captivate your audience when presenting online. I hope that I've given you a couple of tips and things that perhaps you can do with your presentations when you're doing them online. And this also applies if you're just interviewing online. I mean, the better you look, the better you sound online, the easier it's going to be to get to the next step with that company. So or maybe a promotion from within. So play around with some of these things, experiment with them, and you might just find that your entire online presence can be up-leveled in an afternoon just by making a few changes. So that wraps up the formal part of it. Now, before we take questions, I would like you all to please, now that I've given you those 12 things, how do you feel now? Just one word, how do you feel now? Beautiful. That's exciting. It's fun to see the, the words change. And hopefully by the responses that I'm seeing now, you're being as honest with me as I hope you would be. I am seeing the similar kinds of results. I've been doing this webinar now for a couple of months. I actually set it up in November and December when I was talking to my friends in Hong Kong because of all the protests in Hong Kong. Most of the universities had shut down and the only way for us to present to those students was to do it while they were in their homes. So I've been doing these kind of polls with people one to many where I've presented one to 175 students in 175 locations. And I'm so thankful to all of you for giving me a similar kind of response here today. And I truly believe that all of us can be more human when we're online, just remember that the camera needs to be your friend. Don't take your eyes off that camera unless you know that you're taking your eyes off of your audience. And I'm not suggesting you stare them down, but certainly take your time in learning that the camera is your friend. So I want to give you, first of all, my electronic business card. I don't hand out business cards anyway. If you don't have a QR code reader handy, the address on the left, uh, mingle.no slash Nathan. And the two reasons I'm giving you my business card, one is I'm a big fan of LinkedIn. So if you would like to connect with me, even though we haven't met, I will accept your LinkedIn connection. The second reason I want to give you my business card electronically is at the very bottom of the business card, scroll all the way down. On the very left side, you'll see a button for my ebook. Uh, Christina mentioned earlier that I also help with speaking anxiety, and that's true. I have a book out called Harness Your Speaking Anxiety and Connect Emotionally with Your Audience. It came out last June. You get a free copy for joining me on this webinar today. All I ask is please don't download it and share it with a billion of your best friends. A couple of your best friends, that's okay. Questions? Great. Thank you, Nathan. So we okay. Have five questions so far. Uh, if All you right. have any more questions, please feel free to submit them, but let's jump right into them. Nathan, how much time should you take to practice for a 60-minute talk? Woo! Okay, uh, so let's assume that it's 60 minutes of content that you're presenting. That's a lot of content. Uh, can I, let me just assume that there'll be some questions at the end maybe, so it's maybe 50-ish minutes of content. It depends on the, the audience. When I coach TED and TEDx presenters, I get them to commit up front before I accept them as a client 
I get them to commit to two hours of out loud rehearsal for every one minute on stage. Now that's a huge commitment. If they have a nine minute presentation at TED, that's 18 hours of speaking it out loud because that's the only way it can become natural so it doesn't sound memorized. That's the problem. You can memorize a talk, but then getting past the talk, getting past that memorization to the point where you can just say it without any notes, without even thinking and looking around the, the, where you are, you know, that takes practice. That takes a lot of practice. Steve Jobs used to practice one hour for every minute he spent on stage in a keynote. And that was out loud practice. And for TED, TEDx's, I, I get people to commit more than that. So it really depends on the audience. I hope I've given you some guidelines. Right, for a 60 minute talk, 60 hours of practice, that, that's a lot. <laughs> right, uh, next question is, do you memorize your script by heart or do you improvise? Personally, I improvise all of the time. I know approximately the timing of each thing that I'm saying, each story, each anecdote, each slide. I know approximately that gut sense for how much time I can spend on it given how much time we have to talk. This was a 45 minute scheduled webinar. If we had three hours, I could have taken the 12 ways that I just shared with you and I could have stretched it for, for another two to three hours by putting in more stories, examples that I've seen work or examples that I've seen not work. So depending on the content, I might memorize certain things because I want them to come out exactly the way I say it. But I tip, personally, I typically do not memorize a presentation. This happens to be one of those things I'm faced with all of the time because people feel like they have to memorize their pitch. Okay, so one more thing to say about it. If you wanna memorize your pitch, I'm totally good with that. But if you're gonna memorize your pitch or your presentation, you need to realize that memorizing it is only half of the job. The other half of the job is learning how to embrace those words so much so that they don't sound memorized. Think of an actor or an actress on Broadway. Do you think they memorize a script and then they go out on opening night? Hell no, hell no. Memorizing the script is only part of it. Then they had to get out on stage with the paper in their hand and oh, blah, blah. Oh, what was that? Oh, blah, blah, blah. Oh, what was that? Oh, blah, 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 blah. And then days, weeks later, they go up with no script and then they're going, what, what's that line? And then they get that line and they make that connection. And then there's that time where you end up saying, okay, I can do this in my sleep. And then you get up there and it sounds very conversational, sounds natural. My God. You are so great, but what you don't know is that there's been hundreds of hours of practice and out loud rehearsal behind that. I hope I made my point. Go ahead. Uh, sorry, Attila would like to know how you create your presentation script. Depends on the presentation and the goal of the presentation. So I always start with who's my audience and what is my goal? Once I know what the goal is, then I just work backwards from there. Personally, I create all of my presentations by starting with a mind map. Uh, I like to just take a piece of paper and a pen or a pencil and just start thinking, writing down all my ideas and not even thinking about the actual script itself. Once I get all the ideas down on paper and in the form of a mind map, then I start breaking that mind map into the second level of detail. Once I have that done, then the scripting or the flow or the framework of what I want to accomplish kind of sort of pops out for me. If you haven't worked with mind mapping, just put mind mapping into a Google search. You'll see what they are. They're, they're beautiful ways of just getting everything out of your head so you can think straight. And then I pick a framework and I start filling in the blocks. I mean, every presentation has a beginning, a middle, and an end. The beginning is that captivating 
moment or minutes where you need that hook, that grabber, and that tends to be the area that's the hardest part to get going. Once I've got my hook or my grabber for myself or a client, the middle part of the presentation or the scripting is usually pretty straightforward. If people are trying to be persuasive, I get them to do a hook or a grabber, then Simon Sinek, golden circle. Why? That's the problem. How? That's the solution. And the what are the results of your how. All you need at the end is a close or an ask. And that's how I generally script. And there's one more question from Attila, who, by the way, is from the secret company. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you want to tell us who that is? No. <laughs> <laughs> but you would also like to know what your best practice is to adjust your pitch according to the local audience. Excellent. Excellent. Okay, there's two things that I would do. One is try to ask either your organizer of that pitch for some information about the audience so that you can get a sense before you present to them. Uh, or use something like Slido or such as Slido and ask your audience like I did in the beginning. Just be honest and say, ladies and gentlemen, I didn't want to bother you with more email. Could all of you please pick up your smartphone, just answer this one question quickly so I have a sense of who my audience is and that way I can adjust what I say, the stories I use right on the spot. You know what people will think when you say that? They'll go, wow, this guy's good, wow. He can adjust that quickly. I would let people know that you want to know about them because then they feel like, wow, this person's going to present more to me. If you're presenting to only Swedes, then of course you want to not use things like US dollar like I did here today. But because we had people from all over the place, I just stuck with the denomination of uh, the money that I, that, I'm, you know, that I use. Although I haven't spent any money in a long time. So just try to adjust by asking questions beforehand. And if you can't ask them beforehand, ask them right on the spot. And be willing about 10 or some number of minutes into every presentation, I would say most presenters have that awkward, you know what, this just doesn't feel right. Something's not right. And I've had that same experience where you do what you're doing, you're all rehearsed, you're doing everything, but it just doesn't feel right. People aren't responding the way they normally respond. If that happens to me, I would stop and I do this in, in person. Ladies and gentlemen, I don't know if it's me or, or the sunlight or something, but something doesn't feel right here. Can you hear me in the back of the room there okay? Or do we have a good, and I would just ask them, am I on the right, I'm on the right track here? Or am I giving you information that might not better apply? And really quickly, this happened to me in the early 80s. I went to Lockheed with a marketing deck to convince people they need to use our software to do marketing functions. And 10, 15 minutes in, I realized nobody is smiling, nobody is laughing, my jokes are falling flat. And it's not like I've traveled outside the US where American humor usually falls flat. So I literally took a break because something was way off. I said, ladies and gentlemen, excuse me, I need to get a, a quick uh, uh, loo break here. Please take five minutes, have a chat with yourselves. And then I grabbed my organizer and I said, could you please tell me what's going on here? Something's off. And he said, Nathan, you're talking to scientists and you are talking about marketing. They don't care about marketing. They care about science. And I thought, oh, okay, I can fix that. And I grabbed the different set of slides, popped it onto the 35 millimeter projector, got back up there at the break and said, ladies and gentlemen, I am so, so sorry. I misread the audience and now I've been cleared up. So now let's get into some science. Click. And then I started using all my scientific slides and it was a happy time. But I didn't remember, I didn't think to ask the person beforehand. So, but be willing to be vulnerable too. It makes you human. Great. Thank you so much, Nathan. That was the last question. Okay. Thank you, Attila. <laughs>
Thank you so much. So I believe we've come to the end. Uh, I would like to say thank you very much for for presenting to us all these uh, very interesting and insightful tips. Thank you, Slido, and and thank all of the people for joining us today. It's been delightful. We'll follow up with the recording if you'd like it, and I hope to meet all of you one day in the future. Have a wonderful rest of the day. Stay safe. Thank you very much. Hope you enjoyed it, and see you next time. Bye bye. Bye.